right. So how was the uh, Space Jam program? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we'll, what we'll do today is I'm going to go over the, the particular program and um, and also I'll, I'll, I'll write a program in class. Now, I know many of you, you know, are basically done with that program too, but I want to show you how I would have done it. Doesn't mean it's the right way to do it or recommend it. Just, you know, one possibly different way that, you know, to get this program done. <clears throat> right. And of course, you know, by this, by this time, you know, the, uh, the, the feedback is, you know, at the beginning of the semester, the feedback is, why do we have to understand all this math stuff, blah, 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 right? And then at this point, it's like, well, how come we have to go back to programming in this math class? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> because they're really the same thing. They're really exactly the same thing. So what we'll do is we are going to go back to the homework first. Okay, so let's go ahead and, oh, it doesn't let me, there we go. So I'll go back to the homework description and then I'll just go ahead and implement the program exactly the way it is described. And then you guys can ask questions along the way too. Okay, so if you have any questions about you know any particular part of this program, um, go ahead and ask questions. And I'll be doing this in multiple steps, so it's not going to be in one single step. I finish writing a 300 line program, get it compiled, and it runs correctly. That is not going to happen. I cannot write programs like that. So the way I write programs is very slow. Okay, I do it step by step, very very slowly. And first of all, I'm going to check how many people turn it in. So let's see. We got 31 out of 45. Two thirds of the class turned in. Not too bad. No, just kidding. That's horrible. Okay. So, um, all right. So the first thing is to read in the configuration file. Uh, the first integer is the number of trials per experiment which is a sequence, right? So how many characters on each line, basically? The second line is an integer that, indi that indicates the initial number of outcomes per trial. So this is the, how many choices do I have you know, for the first trial? The third line is an integer. If it is a zero, it is with replacement. And it, if it is a one, it is without replacement. And then the fourth line is the name of the output file. Okay, so we already know the file of this. The file name is spacegen.conf. So what we'll do is we'll open up a file you know, with the name your know, spacegen.conf, and then read the integers from it. Um, I do not program in C++ too much. I do program a lot in regular C, so I'll be writing this program in regular C, but not in C++. And let's go ahead and make a folder for this. Space gen. There you go. And we'll go ahead and, you know, I did not make any restrictions as to what file name you have to use. So you can use any file name you want. And I do usually just use main.c as the main file name, unless I have a reason not to. Okay. So what I'll do is I'm, I know I have to use, you know, file operations. Um, I think those are all in stdio.h. Um, and here's the main program, fix no parameters. And then the first thing I need to do is to uh, read in the configuration file. So read conf, which is the configuration file. And the way I write my programs is I like to package things together. So instead of having one single variable for the number of um, trials per experiment, another variable, independent variable, to remember how many choices I have for the first trial, and so on. Yeah. This can you use the read comp method in C++ also? Um. Well, I, I have yet to read uh, write this subroutine. Oh. So okay. I'm so just gonna putting a stub here gotcha. at, at this point. Okay. <clears throat> but getting back to packaging things. Okay. I like things to be packaged. So in this case, I have a configuration you know, struct which to most of you is going to be a class, okay? Because, you know, class does not exist in regular C or C++. Uh, regular C does not have classes. So I'm using a struct. A struct is uh, kind of like a class, but everything is public. 
but I did not have methods in, inside either. Okay. All right. So in in this case, you know, int is fine. You know, just a regular integer is going to be okay for um, number of trials. Okay. So we say number of trials per experiment. Um, is the syntax highlighting okay, or is it interfering with you watching reading the code? It's okay. All right. <clears throat> the second one is going to be the number of choices. Okay, number of choices for the first trial because it depends on whether this is with or without replacement. The third one is a boolean, but in C, you know, there's no bool either, so we only use an int to re to represent something that's boolean. Um, that is with or without replacement, and I'm going to read my own note here. It, if it is a zero, it is with replacement, a one is without replacement. So I'm going to say without replacement here, okay? So a one, zero means with replacement, there we go. And then we have a const, a, a char array to represent the file name where the output is going into. So we'll just give it a name, um, we'll give it a file name. <clears throat> just you know, allocate you know, something that's big enough. I'm not going to test whether your program can handle an insanely long file name or not. Okay, so you know, just any file name is okay. Um, okay, file name. Oh, good file name. There we go. All right. So the nice thing about packaging everything together is in order to call recon or to refer to the configuration file, I only need a pointer to that structure. I don't need to pass like four individual parameters. And I don't want to use global variables either. So this helps me to avoid the use of global variables and at the same time, you know, minimizing the number of parameters that I have to pass around. Is that okay so far? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so readconf you know, needs to have you know, a configuration thing that I can use. So I'm going to say you know, struct conf my conf, okay? So for those for those of you who are into you know Java programming, you know they use M for my, right? Yep. What do you mean by global variable? Do you mean like just to initialize your uh, functions? Um, you can use global variables. I'm not gonna um, take points <coughs> off you know because of styling or you know, what I consider as kind of somewhat dangerous in programming style. So I'm not gonna give you guys any. There won't be any point assignment on. Styling. If you want to, if you want to use global variables, it's okay. I'm just confused because isn't that technically a global variable as well? I don't have a single global variable at this point. The struct is not global. The struct is a is a class definition. So the class definition itself is global, but it is there are no global variables. I, I, I was just I guess I was confused because I just have instead of struct, I just have all those four variables. I'm not quite getting the question. Okay, so I, I declare those four variables. I read uh, whatever uh, it needs to be read in from the file. Yeah. And I pass those variables into the function. Okay. And it does the same thing. Yeah, it does the same thing. Yep. Yeah, and it doesn't reference anything outside. That will be fine. Yep. Okay, so we have a local variable called mconf, and I'm going to pass mconf or the address of mconf to the subroutine called reconf. So now I write the subroutine read con conf, which is configuration. So this is going to be a struct conf, and it is a pointer to a conf uh, configuration structure. Okay. So this is how you know I, I personally prefer to do things, is to package things into structures, and then just pass a pointer of the structure into the subroutine that needs the information or will change that information. <clears throat> So in here, we have to open the file, you know, and, you know, and figure out how to read it. And I haven't really dealt with file operations for a long time, so I'm going to read up on how to do it. Yes, I do not remember how to do file operations, but that's okay. That's what man pages are for. So I'll be using a lot of file F operations, and you don't have to learn this. If you already know how to use C in, C out, you know, Gold Stream and I Stream, with the C++ way, that's cool. I like to use the you know, do things you know just using regular C and this is how we do it. 
So we have the path, the path, which is the file name along with you know, potentially the folder structures, along with the mode. And then when you read the um, uh, documentation on mode, we want to open the file for read-only operations, so R will be fine over there. So we switch back to the source code, and then we just say, um, when, it, when it's done, it returns a file, you know, pointed to a file. So we have, you know, a um, file descriptor. Okay, well, just file is fine. So it's going to be F open, and then we know the file name already. It is uh, space gen.conf, and it is read only. only. So we just open, it up, open the file for read operation. I'm not going to do any error checking here. In other words, you know, I really should be checking to see whether the file is a null pointer or not after F open, but I'm not going to do it, okay, because I'm assuming that everything is okay. Okay, you know, there, there are no errors to check in this case. So after this, I use fscanf, okay, which is kind of the same thing as your C in or using the greater than greater than symbol in um, iStream operations which is reading something from a file and interpreting that at the same time into integers. First parameter is the file itself, okay, the file that we have just opened, which is spacegen.conf, and then we have to supply a format string with scanf. Percent %d is specifying a single integer, so that's why we specify percent %d here. And then we have to pass the address of the thing inside the structure pointed to by the pointer in order to change that. So the first one is num trials. So it's going to be num trials here. And that should read me you know, the number of trials. So copy and paste a few times. The second one is going to be num choices. Okay, so num choices. And then the third one is without replacement. There we go. And then the last one is going to be the string, which is the file name itself. Uh, there is a way to do it too using fscanf, and it is to specify percent %s for string, and that's going to be read into file name like that. Okay. So this is how I'm going to read the configuration file. You know. Um, and I'm going to stop this program, stop writing the program for now, and test it first. <clears throat> how, how many people debug this particular program using a debugger without using just regular printf approach or cout approach? Okay, very good. Okay. Because the way to debug the program is to use the debugger, um, it is a lot more flexible that way, and it is also a lot more um, it's a lot more powerful because you can set up a breakpoint anywhere you want to, and then when your program stops execution or has paused, you can examine not only the variables, but you can basically say, okay, tell me what is this expression, whatever the expression is, as long as it is a valid C expression in the right context, you can evaluate it inside the debugger. Okay, so to make this program work, I need to have a space gen.con file. And we'll have you know five things, five trials per experiment. Uh, let's make it have five choices to begin with. This is with repla without replacement, and the output file is just output.txt. So this is but this is my configuration file. I can just say main, okay, run main by itself. It doesn't crash, which is good, okay, but it doesn't tell me whether the program works or not, right? So what we need to do is to use GDB or in code blocks, you just set up a breakpoint, make sure that the structure itself is populated with the correct values. Okay. And list the program, put a breakpoint on line 25, run the program by itself all the way to line 25, and now I can say print mconf, which is printing the entire structure, and will print me, it will give me you know, everything that is in the structure. Number of trials is five, number of choices is five, without replacement is one, and then the file name is output.txt and then some yada yada yada. But that's okay, because it is an array of 256 characters. It will print all 256 characters in the debugger, because it knows the actual length of the array. But what we really care about is it is output.txt and then a null terminator. That's all. 
we care because it just has to be null terminated correctly. Are we doing okay so far? So now that we know we are reading the file correctly, then we have to work with this. You know, now we work on the actual recursive subroutine. Before we work on the recursive subroutine, it really helps to implement some additional functions. Um, I am going to use a div map to represent a set. In other words, I'm using individual bits of an integer to represent whether a particular element is in the set or not. Is that okay? I kind of mentioned that in class the other day, uh, but I'm gonna use that representation. So it's gonna be a little bit more cumbersome than using an array to represent individual elements of a set, but it's okay. I can just implement certain subroutines to do that. Okay, so what kind of primitive set operations do I need to implement? Especially for this particular program. Well, I need a way to set elements. I need a way to put elements into a set. Because initially the set is full. All five members, you know, all five numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, should be in the set initially. Right? So you need to have a way to populate a set that specify, okay, these elements, you know, should be in the set. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go ahead and write a subroutine to do that. Okay. And we can make the subroutine. There are two ways to do it. Um, I can either make it return the value as a set, or I can just make it pass a pointer to the set itself. And I'm going to choose the, the second way. Okay, so um, add element to set. Okay, and then the first parameter. Now, this time I have to specify you know, the, the actual width of the integer needs to be specified because I want to be able to tell, okay, how many elements can be in this set? In this case, I can have up to 64, okay? Um, and this is going to be a pointer to point to a 64-bit integer, and I'll call this P set, which is a pointer to a set. And then I have to specify, you know, what is the actual value, which can be a very small um, unsigned integer, and this one is the element that we are adding to the set. Okay. In order to use uint 64 underscore t and also uint 32 underscore t, I have to include stdint.h. How many people have some exposure to um, these types? uint 64 underscore t. Okay. So these are recommended if you need to make sure that your integers are of a particular width. These names can be very helpful because they are not platform dependent. Platform dependency basically means I'm running a 64-bit version <coughs> of Linux right now, so integers and int is 64-bit because it's the natural width of an integer. But if I try to compile the same program using a 32-bit architecture, guess what is going to be the width of an integer? 32-bit wide. Okay. So that means sometimes it doesn't matter if you only need to count from 0 to 10. Okay, no big deal. Okay, 32-bit, 16-bit, even 8-bit will do. But on the other hand, if you're using a set, uh, an integer to represent a set, you need to kind of think about, okay, how many elements do I want to be able to contain in this set? I'm just giving myself a lot, a lot of leeway here because we only need zero to nine, or zero to eight, actually, okay? Which means a 16-bit integer is fine. But I'm just giving myself a lot of leeway so, so that I can handle up to 64 elements in a set. But to do this, I need to include the other file, which is stdint.h, which defines the proper way to define all of these terms, like uint64 underscore t, is probably unsigned long long, you know, that's how it, it is defined, but, it, it, but that's not my concern, okay, this is not something that I have to worry about, because when I use the word or use the term uint64 underscore t, I'm guaranteed that pset is pointing to a 64-bit unsigned integer. Any questions at this point? No questions? Okay. So in order to put that element into this set, this is what I need to do. Okay. I'm just going to do this. And that's it. The right hand side of the compound assignment operator is one shifted to the left element times. The element has to be a value between 0 and 63, because if it is exceeding 63, 
it doesn't make sense anymore. You, you would have you would end, end up with a zero. But as long as element is between one, zero and sixty-three, the result of the shifting operation is going to be a bit pattern where we have sixty-three zeros and a single one. And the position of the one depends on element. If element is zero, then the one is the first bit or the least significant bit. If your know, element is three, then we'll have three zeros on the right hand side of the one, and then the rest of that you know number is also going to be zeros. Is that okay? Any questions about this part? No questions? Okay. So we'll need another way to check um, whether an element is in the set or not. Okay. So we'll just say u int 64 underscore t. <coughs> um, check element in set, okay? And once again, we have to specify the set itself. Now this time, I don't really have to pass it by reference or use a pointer to point to it. I can just you know, specify it as a set and pass it by value. Um, and then element is going to be the same. Okay, so using the method earlier to put an element into a set, how do I check whether an element is in the set or not? I have to check it one bit. Go ahead. Bitwise end. Bitwise end. end. Very good. Okay, so that's exactly how we're going to do it. So we just have to return set, in this case using bitwise end, and basically the same expression. In other words, we're basically specifying the same bit mask. One left shifted element times is called a bit mask because you, we are using that to mask set itself. If after the masking we have a non-zero, that means that, that individual bit is a, is a one. If after the masking we have a zero, that means that individual bit is a zero. I don't really care about all of the other bits. Out of the 64 bits, I only care about one single bit. And this is how I can single out an individual bit. All right. Um, I think the rest we can probably do it without using, you know, a particular subroutine. So we'll kind of do it a dirty way. Okay. Now we are actually going into the subroutine itself. Yep. Uh, this, uh, for P set, you mm -hmm. referenced it when you did the four equals. Mm -hmm. But when you did the F scan F, you used the, the ampersand instead. Why uh, aren't you dereferencing the pointer num trials and stuff like that? Mm, I am dereferencing, but I'm dereferencing the I'm dereferencing the pointer of the structure. Okay. Because okay, so this notation here is the same thing as doing a dereference of the pointer itself, and then followed by a dot to represent you know I need to access num trials as a member of the structure pointed to by the pointer. So these these two constructs are exactly the same thing. Okay, this one versus this one, they're exactly the same thing. I'm talking about the ampersand. The ampersand? Yeah. You mean this one? Yeah. This one is needed because F scan F requires a pointer to the thing that you're oh. reading into. So that's why we need an ampersand there. Okay. So that's a very specific thing to F scan F, which is a C uh, feature and not a C++ feature. So in C++, the only reason why you can say you know, C in or whatever the input file is, um, greater than, greater than, and then an integer i, the only reason why you, have, you can say this without using address of is because you have passed by reference in C++. But that is not available in regular C. So that's why I have to pass by pointer instead of passing by reference. So when you guys, yeah, go ahead. The what? This one? Um, this is the same thing as <coughs> that. It's it's a it's called a compound um, assignment, where, where you combine the operator with the assignment operation. It's a shorthand. So what I had earlier, which is bar equal to, you know, one shifted to the left hand side by element times, is exactly the same thing as same as this. It's just you know syntax-wise, you know, this is a longer version of spelling out 
the operation, whereas you know using the bar equal to, which is an, a compound assignment operator, is kind of like a shorthand. Okay. All right. So I think we are ready to get into the actual subroutine. Okay. So I'll call the actual subroutine just gen for generation, and it's going to take a few parameters. And I still remember from from my own lecture, which is amazing. Because I typically forget what I say, you know, really quickly. Um, so the first thing we need to pass in is the set of all the options. Now remember, we are using a 64-bit integer to represent the choices. Okay, so we got choices here. Um, the second thing we have to do is to pass. Um, this only has to be a 32-bit integer; it doesn't have to be long at all. And we'll pass the number of trials left. Right? Okay. So number of trials, trials left. Okay, there we go. And then we have to pass two more things. You know, one is a pointer to the character that this invocation is responsible for. So this is you know, PTR. <coughs> and then we have the starting point of the entire string, which can be a const char, okay, because we are not intending to change that. Um, it's not required that you have to make this a const, but it is. it kind of makes sense to make it a const. The, the difference between the const char and the char, in this case, in a way of controlling where you point to, is really just for the compiler to check whether you're using the parameter in the wrong way. Because if we're not intending to change the beginning of the, the, the array, but we are intending to change whatever PTR is pointing to. So if I accidentally you know, write some code that will change using, S, uh, using start to change the array, the compiler will complain and say, but you promised that you won't change because of the cost. So I might realize, oh, okay, I just made a mistake. I used the wrong pointer. Okay? It is not, especially if you if you name you know, these uh, parameters as PTR1 and PTR2, it's not uncommon that you would use the wrong one. Okay, so this gives the compiler one additional point where you can check and say, okay, are you doing the right thing? The other thing I can do, but I, I'm not doing it because I want to be consistent with my notes you know, from previous lectures, is I can combine all four of these things into one single structure, so I can pass a pointer to a structure into the subroutine instead of passing you know, four individual things into the subroutine. So I could have done that too, but since in the lecture I already started to use this particular format, I'm just going to stick with that. Okay. All right, so this is going to be a recursive subroutine, and in any type of recursive subroutine, the first thing I would you know, think about is when do I stop? Okay, so the moment that I stop is when num trials left, number of trials left, is zero. Okay, if it is a zero, we stop the recursion. Otherwise, we have some more recursions to do. Okay, stop recursion. Recursive call. And this is also a typical way that I write code, is if I kind of know that the, the each branch of a conditional statement can be kind of long and involved, I would start off with the comments right away. So I would put in the open and the curly, close curly braces, and the comment to basically say, what does it mean if I end up in this branch? Because as I start to code, I might lose track of the condition itself, of the conditional statement. Then it becomes a big issue. It's like, okay, I can see the open and the close curly braces here, but what is it, what, what am I supposed to do here? This way, I have a reminder to myself and go like, okay, if I'm here, that means I have to do blah, 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 blah. Okay, just, yeah, just a way to remind myself. I know you guys are not nearly as forgetful as I am, so you may not need that. <laughs> but over the years, I learned that I need a lot of reminders, and this is how I remind myself, what does it mean if I end up at this branch, and what does it mean if I end up at the other branch? Okay, so when I can stop the recursion, I got nothing else to do except to print out the string. So I'm going to use fprintf, or put string is fine too. F put s, which is put string. Oh, I have one more thing to pass, which is the, the file itself. So I need one more thing. We'll put it here. Output file. It's going to be a pointer to a file. We'll worry about opening it up later on. So this is our file, and going to be the string, which is start. It's a null-terminated string, so we just have to supply the address of the first character. 
And then we have to check whether f put s is also going to end with a new line. And I cannot remember that at all, so we'll go ahead and check that. Okay, f put s is, oh, we have to specify the stream as the second parameter too. It writes the string as to stream without its terminating null byte, but it doesn't put an end of line either. Okay, so that's up to the subroutine to do. So we'll go ahead and put it here. So we'll say f put, okay, I cannot remember the name of that either. So we'll go ahead and, I think it's f put char or put c. f put c is putting a single character. Okay, that's what we need. A single line feed character. You can specify it like this. You can also specify 10, which is the ASCII code of the line feed character. And an out file is the second parameter. There we go. Okay. So I think that will handle the um, the case when we terminate the recursive call. So when we do have a recursive call, what are we going to do? Well, what this is really saying is we have at least one trial left. Okay. So I'm responsible for one of those. Do you guys remember the loop to do this? We have to look at all the remaining choices, remember? For each element of the of choices, we have to you know, pick it out and take it out of the set, okay? And then pass the changed set to the next level. But we also have to print out you know, that particular character. Do you guys remember something like that? Sort of, okay? All right, so using this particular representation of a set, this is how I would do it. I, I would use a local variable, which has the same type as an element. Okay, we'll call it E because if I use that term E in the um, pseudocode, so we'll use E here. So for E equals to zero, which is the, the first possible value, E um, is less than 64, oops, less than 32, which is, um, oh, six, less than 64, sorry. Because that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm making this program being able to handle up to 64 elements in the set, even though in a homework assignment, we only need up to nine elements in the set. Is that okay? Okay, I'm not gonna take any points off you know, if your program can exceed the limits of the stated limitations or specifications. Okay. And then plus plus E. So here's a for loop. The first thing I would do is to check Check element in set. Which set are we talking about? The parameter that was given to me, which is choices, and then the element is E. If this is returning non-zero, that means you know I have just found an element. Otherwise, I have nothing to do. Okay. Does that make any sense? So I'm scanning the entire set or the representation of a set and check to see if E is in the set or not. If E is not in the set, I have nothing to do. If E is actually in the set, then I have something to do with this particular E. Yep? Uh, why do you have the output start with the output um, Because that's the way the parameters are supposed to be called, to be passed. You specify what you're printing first, and then you specify what is the file uh, that you're printing to. clear when we call this from main. Okay, so keep that question around you until we get to the actual call to gen from main itself. Okay, all right. I am forgetting one particular subroutine as a set primitive, okay, because we have add. We should have another one called remove, okay. Remove element from set, which is having the same sort of parameters. P set is a pointer to a set. And then element is specifying which element do I want to take out of a set. So we just copy and paste this code a little bit here, but this time it is an emperor's and here, and then we have a bitwise or bitwise not here. All right, so let's figure out what this code is doing. The okay, I'm good. I, I can highlight which part I'm talking about here. So this part is still specifying which bit are we interested in, because we're still shifting the one. 
um, element times to the left hand side. So we are still you know, just specifying, okay, which bit are we interested in? But the bitwise not is going to negate, do a bitwise negation, which means all the zeros become ones and all the ones become zeros. So the one bit that I'm interested in is the one that is now a zero. Everything else are ones. Is that okay? And by doing a bitwise and with this portion, it means you know the, the one bit that I'm interested in is guaranteed to be zero. But all the other bits remain unchanged. Okay? All right. And I forgot one really important lesson that I learned from another class, which is this needs to be typecasted to u in 64 underscore t. Because one has an implicit type. Guess what is the implicit type of one? Int. It's an int, which is 32 bit wide, even if with a 64 bit architecture, which doesn't, which doesn't make any sense. Here's another question. Is it faster to access a 64 bit integer or faster to access a 32 bit integer? Is a trick question. Hmm? Depends on the architecture. Okay, that's the best answer. Okay, I did not think of that, but it is the best answer. <laughs> but using a processor that is natively 64 bit wide, it doesn't make a difference. It would use exactly the same amount of time. Okay? Because each memory fetch is fetching at least 64 bit at a time, which means it doesn't save you <coughs> any time at all if you're reading a 32 bit integer. The only difference is, if you're reading a 64 bit integer, you're using, you're utilizing every single bit that you read. If you're reading a 32 bit integer, you're still reading 64 bit in, except you're throwing away 32 bits out of those 64 bits. Yep, it doesn't make any you know, difference as far as execution speed is concerned. Okay, all right, so we have one more here that we need to fix, okay u in 64 underscore t, because if I don't fix that, it's not going to work for really huge numbers. It won't show up with the limitations that I've put in the homework assignment, but it will show up when I start to access element 32, 33, and so on, then the problem will start to show up. Yes, I'm fixing this program unnecessarily because it won't even show up. But it's, 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 it's good to know, okay? It's good to know that it, those are potential problems, okay? So if that particular element is in choices, then what I'll do is I have a set in here, okay? Next set, okay? So next set is gonna be the same thing as my choices, except I have to take away element E. So I have to say remove element from set and then we have to pass the set in first, which is next set. And then element is E that we are removing. And we are done with this. We are now ready, almost ready to do the recursive call. I just have to remember to set the character corresponding to this invocation to E plus the ASCII code of zero. Because E is going from zero to eight in this case. So in order to print it out you know, as a character, from 0 to 8, we have to add the value, which is 0 to 8, to the ASCII code of 0. Then it becomes the ASCII code of 0 to 8. Is that okay? Sort of? Yep. What's the 64? Hmm? What's the 64? Because I want to be able, I want to be able to handle the the, 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 the most I can throw at this program, which is you know, having 64 possible choices per trial. Yeah, exactly. But this program can handle far more than that. Okay. All right. Almost there. Okay. So now we we can call this recursively, which is Gen. Next set instead of choices. Um, we have um, one fewer thing, so it's num trials we left minus one. Uh, start doesn't change, but PTR does. Okay, so we have to move on to the next character position for the next invocation. And then the rest is just start, which is by itself. And I'm forgetting the file 
pointer too. So we need to pass our file here. And I also forgot one more thing here because we have to no terminate the string itself. So it really does not, it, it's helpful to put a no terminator to the string first before we print it out, assuming it's going to be no terminated. All right. So I think we're almost there, except for one thing. We have to remember to open the file based on you know, the file name. So I'm going to do it over here. And well, there are several places, places to do it. I'm just thinking about where to put it. Eh, we can put it in main. We can do it. We, we can put that in main. So we'll put it in main. Out file. It's going to be here. And we'll do a file open out file equals to file open and then we specify the file name first which is mconf dot uh, I forgot the file the, the member name file name and then we have to specify the uh, mode of operation okay so let's go ahead and check it again okay uh, man I know which string I need but I will go ahead and double check okay so file open, you know, need to, needs to specify a mode, and the mode can be W for truncate the file to zero length or create text file for writing. Can be write W plus for reading and writing. Can be A for open for appending. Can be A plus for open for reading and appending. So what we really need to do is just a simple W because we are opening the file to write to and we are overwriting anything that is already there. Okay. So we just say, you know, W. Oops, no, has to be lowercase. And that will open the file for writing. And now we can call the subroutine recursively, which is gen, specify the file pointer first. And it has to be the address. Oh, this is supposed to be the address of a file. So we have out file. In your case, if you're using C++, you just have to pass um, a reference of the O stream to the subroutine, okay? Unless you use a global variable. How many people used global variables? <laughs> okay. Um, we need a set, okay? So this is how we specify a set. What? Because I want to frown upon that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we also need the initial set, okay, right? Because you know, we need to pass an initial set with every single possibility in it, uh, confined only by number of possibilities for the first trial. Okay, so we'll have the initial set. We'll just call it twice as two. Okay. Can someone tell me how to use a single line to initialize choices based on the parameters specified in the configuration file, knowing that the set is a bitmap? In other words, if I specify, let's have you know, six possible choices, six choices per trial, um, how do I set the least significant six bits of an integer, but with, with only one single statement, without a loop? I want to spec okay, so if it is a six, I want to specify one 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 one. Oops, that's one too many. There we go. And then the rest are all zeros. How do we, how do, we do this? If you if you know your binary subtraction, this should be easy peasy. Okay, what is one zero 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 in base two minus one? We're talking about base two subtraction here. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow, right? 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with a borrow. 1, 1, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6. And there'll be a bo extra borrow here. 1 minus 1 is a 0. I get what I want. So how do we get this to begin with? Left shift. Okay? So, so the initialization of choices is 1, Shifted by um, mcon dot. This is where I start to miss um, Android Studio, which is kind of the same thing as um, Eclipse, where you know 
once it recognizes what mconf is, it will start to prompt you about the possible members because I cannot remember the name of the members. I think it's num trials. Because the tools are num choices, dang it. Okay. Num choices. There we go. Okay. There we go. So num choices and then the whole thing minus one. So that will set the number of bits that I need, the least significant so many bits that I need as the initial initial choices. And I just pass it here, choices. Um, next thing we need to specify is how many trials we have, which is mconf.numtrials. Okay, let me just double check because I keep forgetting how I named the members. Okay, um, then we need the two things. Okay, so this is going to be answering your question. Okay, the start thing. Okay, so we need to reserve a space for all of that stuff here you know, for printing. So since I you know give myself you know, up to sixty four characters, so my buffer is going to have sixty five characters. Okay, you know, because it can be sixty four plus that one. So we'll specify buffer buffer. In other words, the first time you call Jan, I am using buffer to pass as PTR, which is what the first invocation is responsible to handle in the, in the array, and also buffer again as the starting point. But the starting point never changes. I just need to pass it along until we get to the end of the recursion, so we know where to print it from. If for those people who use global variables, you know, the, the last parameter need, does not need to be passed because it's the same thing. All right, so I think this is it, okay? What do you think? Yep, go ahead. Uh, are you able to use the dot operator? Sorry? The mconf dot file name and the mconf dot no choices if you use global arrows? Um, I do not need the arrows because mconf is an actual structure. It's not a pointer to a structure. Right. Yep. Isn't this only without replacement? Only. Oh, that's right. I need to specify with or without replacement too. Okay, we need to add one more parameter here. Mconf dot without replacement. Ah, okay, I really should have made a struct to do it. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, I don't think uh, your choices will want to be nine 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 nine. Instead of one one one, because it's an int. You're subtracting uh, two ints. You mean you didn't cast it to you ints. Oh, okay. You mean this one? You're correct. I really should cast it because otherwise, if I have so more than thirty two like, choices, then I'll be in trouble. Wouldn't it be like six thousand minus one, which is like five nine nine nine? No, because that's base ten. These are all bitwise operations. Oh, okay, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, everything internally is represented in binary. So, so we need to change the prototype here because we need to check the replacement thing. All right. So here's the question. Um, this is without replacement. So how do I do it with replacement? Well, other than adding one last parameter here to pass that along without replacement. So other than this, you know, in the code itself, in the logic of this code, how do we deal with with replacement? The, the way it is right now is without replacement because I took E out of the set before I pass it along to the next invocation. So how do we do it with replacement? Don't do it. Don't take it out. Yep. Yep. So we will just go ahead and make it conditional. So we will just make this part conditional and say if not oh with if without replacement technically i don't need curly braces in this case but it's good to be consistent and use curly braces all the time okay that should do it that should take care of the with or re without replacement part so with so with replacement which means without replacement is a zero that means you know i'm just passing the same choices along every single time which makes sense Okay, what do you think? Do you think it's gonna 
compile. Because that's usually the first first thing I run into is I miss a semicolon somewhere. Okay, I don't miss co close curly braces anymore. Can anyone tell from just you know today's class why I never have a missing and curly brace? You want to get the second curly brace before you even write your code? Yep. Which I find is actually efficient for myself. You know, some of you may not like it because you you will have to. Okay, new editors are smarter. When you open the curly brace and you press the enter key, it automatically inserts the closed curly brace for you. I mean, you know, we are going to get so spoiled. Okay, you type the name of a structure, you put a dot, it will automatically prompt you and say, "Oh, which member do you want?" Okay, I think in twenty years we'll all be like Dory. <laughs> Because there's, there's no need for a short-term memory anymore, so we'll all be like Dory. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. It's a Disney movie. We can, we can, we can ignore that without any any type of a negative effect. Okay, so we'll we'll give it a try. Okay, G plus plus or G C C actually dash O main main dot C. Wow, it actually compiled. Okay, main, run it, and we have an output file. And does it look right to you? Right, it looks okay to me. How many things should be in this particular file? How many lines should it have? We are deal dealing with uh, permutations, right? Because you know, if we are doing with replacement, then it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's with or with. It doesn't matter whether it's permutation or permutation. So permutation only applies when it is to be dealing with something that is without replacement, which is this case. Okay, so we, we want permutation. We have chosen five things out of five things, and we want to count the number of permutations. Okay, so what is that number? Five factorial, which is five times four times three times two times one, which is 120. Okay, so I think it's pretty close, right? I mean, this is line 101. So by the time we get to the end of this file, it should be 120. There we go. So we, we are just double checking whether the program is working or not. Because visually, it seems like it's working. But looking at the number of lines it's generating is another way to double check that it is actually working correctly. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and do one thing to the configuration file because I have just really checked one of the options. So let's go to spacegen.conf again. This time we change it to a zero and we'll change it to a different output file. Run main again, look at output one. And this time, how many lines should we be looking at? I'm not pressing the enter key just yet because VI automatically display the number of lines in the file. So five to the power of five in this case, which is what? I can't do that. Six twenty-five times five. Okay, which is what? Thirty-one point five. Thirty-one. Okay, pretty close. Thirty thousand ish. Three thousand ish. Okay. Yep. There we go. Yeah, that's why I didn't press the enter key because the moment I get into VI, you guys can tell, oh, it has 3,125 lines. So there we go. All right. So, what is the trickiest part of this program from your perspective? Hmm? Recursion? Okay. In CISP 430, did, did you guys have to deal with recursion? Okay. Yeah. Sort of. Okay. So the, the way I deal with recursion is I think about what to do, but only from one single invocation's perspective. Okay, so let me go to main again. So from my perspective, you know, when I'm writing code that uses recursion, I'm simply asking myself, okay, when do I stop? Okay, that's the first and easiest question to answer. Is how can I tell from the parameters? of this function when I can stop, okay? So you look at the parameters. The first parameter, which is out file, obviously is not gonna tell me anything about when you can stop, okay? If it's an in file, maybe, because you, can, you may be able to use end of file as a condition, but definitely not in this case, it's an output file. Choices, possibly, okay? 
number of trials possible because both of these things can change on a per invocation basis. Um, PTR possible, start definitely not because it doesn't change. Without replacement, definitely not because it doesn't change either. So you look at the remaining choices, okay, which is choices itself, none trials left, um, and PTR. So out of these three, you have to say, okay, which one or how do I combine these things to tell me when to stop? Uh, none trials left is really the one that, that should stand out. Um, choices can be used as well, okay, because you can say if there are no elements left in choices, then there's nothing I can do, okay? So maybe that can be used as a reason to get out too, okay? But in this particular case, none trial left, none trials left is definitely the most reliable way to terminate the recursion because it is possible that this is with replacement. So choices never changes. So you have to use the you know, non-trials left as a terminating condition. So when there's no trials left, okay, then there's, there's nothing for you to do. This invocation has nothing to do. So you can stop. Because you just print out whatever is set up by the other invocations and then just get out. Um, when in the case that you do have something to do, which is the else case, then you have to think about, okay, I'm only to, I'm going to handle only one of the trials of the entire experiment. Okay, so that's the way to focus, is to say, I'm only dealing with one of the trials, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through choices and see which element is left in that particular set. If I can find one, which is um, inside the conditional statement inside the for loop, if I can get into here, then I say, Oh, okay, I just found an element in the choices set. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it as my own character, as the experiment, okay? So this is the, this is the most important part of a recursive subroutine, how to write one, is to defer the rest of the operation to another invocation. It's the recognition that you are solving a big problem, you're handling one part of the big problem, but then whatever is left of that problem looks exactly the same as what you have to handle, except it is one, put it one shorter or one smaller compared to what you are handling. So we have one fewer trials to deal with now, but if it is also without replacement, then your set becomes one element fewer as well. So the way to look at recursion is to figure out how do I break a big problem into smaller problems? But the constraint is those smaller problems have to resemble the big problem that you you're, that you start off with. So you're solving a little part of the big problem, and then you're left with a smaller problem, or possibly smaller problems. Okay, but each one has exactly the same nature as the big problem to begin with. Then you can use recursion. Is that okay so far? Okay. All right. Any other questions about this particular program? Yep. I, I see how you initialize your, your choices set at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. you just scroll up the sure. You mean down, because it's in main, which is down. I can turn on line numbers too, so you can refer to the line number that you want me to look at. Are you referring to line 74? Yeah. Okay. So let's say num choices is six, okay? So if num choices is six, then um, one shifted six times will give me this. Is that okay? So when you subtract one from this number, remember this is in base two. So when you subtract one from this number, which only has a single one, and then you have six zeros to the right hand side of that one, when you subtract one from this, you end up with six ones as the least significant bits, which would correspond to zero to five when I print it out. Okay, cool. I can surely do that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and upload this to shared folder. This is 440.
which basically means I won't be using the same question next year. So next year we'll have a different homework assignment. Does that make you feel better or worse? Sorry? Potentially harder, yes. Not always. Okay, so space gen. And the program name is just main. Uh, that's not a good name. Okay, I can I can rename it here. It's, it's no big deal. So we'll just rename it to uh, space gen. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Yep. Yes.
think this is the hardest part of the assignment, is just trying to figure out how you rate work. Because uh, I, I couldn't, I just didn't understand it, how it would, uh, it would get reset every time. Okay, you, you, you mentioned reset, but what do you talk about? Uh, which thing or which parameter get a reset? It goes back because of the subroutine when you when you, you're in gen. Okay, so let's see, right here. So after this invocation of gen returns, wh where does it go? Well, first of all, tell me where are we at this point? Okay, this particular call to gen is inside what control structure? Not if you know, the if is you know just about it. It's inside the for, right? So what do you do after the last statement inside the for? check the condition again, right? So after this gen, it will go back to check the condition again, which is whether E is still less than 64, right? Okay. And let's say it is. So if E is still less than 64, then where do we go? Well, we check whether E is in the set or not. Now, you, you guys can say, well, but this is, this is awfully inefficient because in the homework assignment, you specifically say that we only have nine, up to nine, choices per experiment, per trial, this is like spending, you know, 60, not 60, but 55 iterations checking for nothing, because none of those are guaranteed to be zeros, right? The, but the question is, can this program work incorrectly based on the limitations or the constraints of the homework assignment? No, it will still work, it's just not efficient, because it's checking things that are guaranteed not to be in the set. But within the first nine items, Okay. There's a potential that this conditional statement will, will, will turn true again. We just found another element in the set, right? So what do we do when we find another element in the set? Goes into the conditional statement, right? So we make a copy of the set itself, and depending on whether we are dealing with, with or without replacement, we might decide to take that one element out of the copy of the set. We change the character to be E again, but this E is different from the one from the previous invocation, previous uh, iteration of this loop. And then we just call gen again and say, hey, I just handled another possibility of the second invocation. Um, I know there are more things that we have to do. Do, the rec do it recursively. I'm not gonna handle the third or the fourth place. Somebody else is gonna do it. I'm not sure whether that helps to explain the algorithm or not. Go ahead. It was so I think what the problem is is that people think they have to reset the array, but you're just writing over it. Basically. Yes, I am writing over it. You just write over it. You don't ever have to reset it. I think people are thinking they actually have to go back and somehow reset the array uh, to lose those things that you don't. Okay, go ahead. So I'm just going back to the skitters having more characters. It doesn't quote unquote go back, it's just that when you return from the subroutine, the, okay, the next invocation of gen has the pointer being one after the one that I'm dealing with, right? But when, when it returns back to me, I have my own PDR. Each invocation has its own PDR parameter that is independent from the other invocations. This really is the essence of recursion, is to understand that parameters and local variables are on a per invocation basis. When you do it recursively, the next level of recursion or the next level of invocation has its very own copy of its own parameters and its very own local variables. Yep. I think someone over here asked if the array was copied and said no. The, the, the array was never copied. There, there's only one array in the entire program. Well, not counting file name and stuff like that, but for printing the uh, trials out, there's only one single array. All I'm doing is to control which part of the array am I pointing to. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so when you're adding 
the one to the pointer here, all it's doing is it's moving the index of the array. Exactly, it is moving just the index. Yeah, I don't think people realize that you can do that. With you can, oh, oh. Because if okay. there ever been, if, if I took Antos and we do it that way, but I don't think the other two teams might have ever moved an array that way. Okay, so there are different ways to do this. You can pass just the index, zero, one, two, three, four, you know, and so on. You can pass the index, then you'll just have to take the address of, or just increment the index here. You know, that will serve the same purpose. Correct. Okay, so, okay. I, I'm starting to put the picture together, you know, why, you know, people might have a problem with this code, especially this version, because, you know, pointer arithmetics may not be included in all the classes in 360. Is that right or not? Pointer arithmetics, okay. But you don't have to use pointer arithmetics, okay? Because I can change this program not to use pointer arithmetics and it can still do the same thing. Okay, so let's say I don't want to deal with pointer arithmetics. Then I change this to u in 32 underscore t and just make it an index, okay, there we go. So we, once we make this an index, I look at all the occurrences of PTR, and just say this becomes start index equals to zero, start index, and over here, it would just be index plus one because I'm incrementing the index by itself by one. And then over here, in order to start from the very beginning, the initial index should be zero. So this program should behave exactly the same way without using pointer arithmetic. In, in, in other words, not knowing pointer arithmetic is not an excuse not, not getting it done. <laughs> Even though it's good to understand it, it is not required to get it done. Anything else? Yep, go ahead. I don't really understand any of it, so I'd like to ask him in the office hour. But okay. um, I don't really understand uh, how is it, like, the thing I'm, I struggle with the most is uh, how is it, like, choosing and putting it in? Like, uh, it's just, where is it uh, comparing it to what is it choosing uh, for the, uh, 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 for the check element, well, what is it, how is it choosing, and uh, how is it putting it into the array, is what I'm really confused about. You mean the, the set operations, like add element to set, remove element from set? Because those are set operations, I'm just being able to see if a particular element is in the set or not, I'm removing a particular element from the set, Is that you know, the beginning of your question? I mean, because, because a part of this homework assignment is the implementation of the concept that we know as a set. In, at the, in, the, in the first three weeks of this class, we talk about set operations, remember? We talk about intersection, we talk about union, we talk about subtraction and stuff like that. This is really just you know saying, okay, now that we know what a set is and what we can do with a set, can we do it in code, in C code or C++ code? The answer is yes. In fact, you have choices of how we can do it. But is that your question? I mean, or do you have a, or is your question on something else? And this is one of many ways to do it. If you prefer, you can use an array of bools in C++. So each element, is a boolean representing whether the a particular element is present or absent in the set. So that's another way to easily implement a set. Yeah. Just to clarify, so choices is initialized in the main. Yes. And then it's passed through to the, the gen. Yes. From there, that's where you implement your version as well as the upon that. That is correct. Initial array. Yeah. So in this case, the choices is initialized the third line from the end of main. 
Um, it's based on the tricks of binary arithmetic. Um, but if you don't like the, that particular trick, you can use a loop to initialize. Yeah. So you can just loop through you know, all the elements that, that are supposed to be in, and then call the set primitive to add an element into the set. Yeah. So you can do that too. Yeah. Or, exactly. This is just a really quick and dirty trick to do with using yeah. binary yeah. arithmetic. Yep. But the trick is in the recursive call, in the recursive subroutine, you basically just say, I'm handling a small part of the big problem. But the, whatever is remaining has resemblance to the problem that you were given with, just one little bit, a little bit smaller. Exactly. And that's how we can use recursion. Yep. Should this work for 64 uh, trials? It should. Um, we only have a big problem with this in terms of printing, because when you add um, 10 to the ASCII code of zero, it is not a digit anymore. So it will start to use kind of funky you know, stuff in the ASCII table. So, so that's a good question. Um, so when you look at the ASCII table, you have to look up you know, what is after 9. So it will start to use colon, semicolon, less than, equal to, greater than, question mark, um, to represent values uh, in, the, in the trial. So the greatest is technically 9. Sorry? The greatest would be 9 trials. Yeah, in the homework assignment, I specifically say that you, can, you only have nine. Technically, it's 10 because you have zero to nine you know, as digits. So technically, you should, have, you should be able to handle up to 10 choices per trial. But in the homework assignment, I said nine, so it's just nine. I was wondering, because in that case, the casting doesn't even matter, because you're never getting, reaching, uh, the, to, you're never reaching 64 bits. The casting still matters. Because you know, if I specify you know with replacement, I can always specify the number of uh, trials per experiment to be more than thirty-two. Not in the homework because I placed the restriction on the homework, but in general, I can always do that. Yeah, question. So my question is, because you said it works up to sixty-four, what happens if you uh, shift bit shift one sixty-four uh -huh. times? Will that be just all zeros? It will all be zeros. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Question. Uh, the next assignment um, said to zip the file. Is it with the, the space gen that like the source file? No, without. But okay. yeah. So the second assignment is completely independent to the first one. Okay. Um, although, although you might want to download this program and get it to work because this can help you generate the input file into your second homework assignment. Because your second homework assignment is to count the number of unique items or unique elements in a particular you know, trial. So this program can be useful to serve you to, to give you an input into the second program. Okay. Very good. Any other questions about the homework assignment about this particular program? So I think this is really great. Okay, you know, I know most of you, especially those 15 people who did not turn in their homework assignment, may think otherwise. <laughs> but I think this is great because it's connecting the discrete math theoretical concept to actual practice. Okay, now you might ask, you know, who would write a space gen program, you know, in real life? Well, guess what? There are programs called generate and test. It is a very common AI approach to do things. It's called generate and test where you generate your possible cases and then you have some kind of a test to evaluate whether you know, it is, you know, whatever you're generating is a reasonable choice or not. Okay? And the recursive algorithm is just you know, quick and easy to write to generate your possibilities. Um, and if, if anyone is still not convinced that you need to understand you know, recursion, the concept of set operations and whatnot, we'll make another program to deal with, um, gosh, what is the name of that? Mastermind the game. There we go. Okay? And we'll make it so that the computer is guessing and you are the one finding the combination. Then you will start to really appreciate, you know, because there's some routines and the generate and test approach. Does anyone know what it is, the mastermind game? Yes. 
it's not a twenty question. The, the mastermind game is like this. Okay, so you you can choose. Uh, typically, there are six colors to pick from, and there are four pegs. Okay, so you basically just go. You pick your own secret combination. Okay, I'm picking brown, uh, red, yellow, blue. Okay, and position is important. Okay. So somebody, you know, the hacker is trying to guess, you know, what your hidden power is. So somebody, you know, may say, you know, okay, is it all blue? Okay, blue, 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 and they go like, well, we got a blue, and you know, out of four blues, one of the blue is the correct color at the right position. That's all I'm going to tell you. Then you might say, okay, what about blue, blue, yellow, yellow? Okay, and they go like, mm, you got one thing that got the color and the position right. And you got one thing that got just the color right, but the position is wrong. So I'm giving you these feedback, and then you know. So the trick is, in six, can you guess the actual color permutation because ordering is important? In six guesses, <laughs> that's the mastermind game. So you, you might want to look it up. Okay. So if you are playing, is is it, hard enough? What if you want to make the computer play that game? So you're the one hiding the pattern. You give the clues to the computer, and then the computer has to figure out, hmm, based on all the clues that I have collected, can it possibly be this? So that is, you know, something that you might want to think about. Just think about it. I'll see you guys on Thursday.